Hi there and welcome to the 13th row in the Get Fit by Rowing series. Now today we're going to be back to that nice low intensity row because what we're going to do is six five minute intervals with 30 seconds rest in between. Now from a heart rate training point of view you're going to do this at zone two so that means between 60 and 70 percent of your maximum heart rate. Now I'd rather you kept it round about 65 percent to give you a bit of headroom just in case it starts to drift up and you can ease off the intensity before that 30 second rest comes in and that will hopefully then settle your heart rate right back down again. If you're doing this at a 2k training pace remember it's kind of divergent to that heart rate thing. You might start in the same level but as you keep on rowing through these intervals at 2k plus 18 to 20 what you might find is that your heart rate breaks out of that 60 to 70 percent. That's fine because you're doing it as a 2k training pace not as heart rate. They're kind of similar but they're not similar right. And then finally for those that just kind of think right an intensity point of view you're looking looking at that kind of 5 out of 10 intensity. This is round about what it will feel like if you were just constantly walking up a flight of stairs where your breathing gets a little bit heavier, your heart rate gets up, but it never really feels like you're working too hard, okay? And that's the important part of today's role. Okay, so we need to get into a four minute warm up. We're still gonna do the warm up. Uh, I'm gonna do that first before we get into our main row and we have to set up our machines. Now, as you can see, I'm back on the water rower. So all the next four sessions I'm gonna do on the water rower. So there isn't really much for me to set up. I just need to make sure that my monitor is at eye height and that my foot stretchers are at the right height. If you're on a Concept2 or something else that has a resistance dial, then Concept2, set your drag factor where you want it to be. If you don't know about drag factor, set it between four and five and check out the video I have on this channel. <gasps> or if you just have a resistance dial, set it to a place where you get a nice weight from the stroke, but not so much that you have to heave to get it moving. And as for those foot straps, it's kind of the same for everyone. If you're able to adjust your foot stretch, your height foot straps, then get them to a point where you're able to get to the front of the machine with the shins pointing vertically comfortably. If you're set too high, then it can kind of bind up your flexibility, which I'm a little bit just come so inflexible this morning before I start rowing. Um, if you're set too low, then you can go scooting straight past that point. Hopefully, my flexibility will improve as we get through this warm up. That's kind of the point of doing the warm up. So, we're going to do this at a nice, gentle opening pace for the first minute. We'll increase it a little bit, but not too hard because we're just trying to warm up. Should we start rowing? Let's. Okay, so we're going to do this warm up at run about 20 strokes a minute in three, two, one. Let's go. So no matter what you're rowing on, just start nice and gently. I keep on saying it's like, kind of like you're standing up. Say you had a bag of shopping in each hand and you just squatted down to the ground to pick up your car keys or something, right? <laughs> Although, why would you still be holding on to your, oh, come on, come on, run with me on this one. Then the amount of power you're putting in for this first minute is just, Enough of a push from your legs as though you were standing up from that squat. And this will help your body just get moving, just to put in a little bit of power. You can start to feel the forces going up through your body. And then in five strokes time, we'll just increase this intensity a little bit up to round about what today's main pace is gonna be, that kind of five out of 10 effort. Where you start to feel like you're putting in a little bit of work but not loads, okay? So from now, for the next minute, just increase a bit, up to 2K plus 20 pace maybe, if you have a 2K average, or just that five out of 10. And I want you to think about pushing with the legs here, okay? So push with the legs, nice straight arms at the front, forwards, tilt over your hips, hold that, and then push. And it's almost like you're trying to hold that forward tilt for as long as possible through your stroke. You'll eventually just run out of space and naturally swing back and pull in your arms. So just think about push for as long as you can. Right, so three strokes time, but we'll take one foot out of the straps. Two more, one more. So I'm going to take one foot out, move my water bottle out of the way, put it on the ground, continue rowing. I managed that in three seconds. <laughs> That's handy. Now this just helps with opening up your hips, which again comes down to flexibility. Whereas like I said, mine I felt a little bit tight and stiff as I started the row today. So hopefully this is going to go some way to 
opening up my hips and my flexibility. Let's swap feet. I didn't bother strapping in this foot as I returned it. But what I'll do is make sure to strap it in for the last minute of this warm up when we do arms and back only and then legs only rowing. So that's gonna have to be a quick maneuver. <laughs> so two more strokes, then get those feet back in. One more. Don't worry if you lose time here as you try and get your feet in. Ooh. Let's see, timed pit stop. Oh, that took a while. So you're gonna use your back and arms to so you swing over your hips first and then you pull in your arms, then out with the arms, and rock forwards again. I'm perched right on the edge of the seat here, I'm about to fall off. <laughs> okay. Let's take one more just because we lost time on the transition. And roll to the front with straight arms and a forced tilt, and push out from the front. Now when I was saying about trying to push for as long as possible before swinging back, this is a really good drill for that. How long can you keep that push of the legs before you kind of lose that connection or that power from your legs. One more here oh, and finish. I just always feel like finishing with a full stroke at the end. There we go. So that is the warm up done. Not that intense at all really, was it? And that's kind of the intensity that we did in that second minute that we're doing our main session at today, which I'll describe again while you're having a quick drink and moving up and down the rail. Okay then, so today's session is back to that nice low intensity. We're gonna do six five minute intervals with 30 seconds rest in between at around about 20 strokes per minute. Now your heart rate's gonna be between 60 to 70% to keep this as a zone two row. If you're using a 2K training pace, then do this between 2K plus 18 and 20. And if you're using the effort out of 10 scale, then it's gonna be around about five out of 10. So it really isn't that tough a row. I'll talk more about why and whatever during the main session, but there's no point in me talking about it here because we might as well get on rowing. So I don't really want you to get all cooled down after the warm-up. What's the point of doing a warm-up if, <laughs> if we don't actually stay warm? So we're gonna do this, like I say, 20 strokes a minute. Watch me for stroke rate if you're a little bit um, uh, raggedy, is that the right word? If you can't quite hold 20 strokes a minute, just kind of go with me. Uh, yeah, and we'll do five minutes, then 30 seconds rest. Don't keep on doing that until we're done. All right, here we go then. In three, two, one, let's go. Right. So, like I say, watch me for uh, stroke rate. If you're at all um, kind of wobbly when it comes to trying to hold 20s. Because I know a lot of people don't feel comfortable at low stroke rates. So, and that's fine. Maybe you've spent all your time rowing at 20 to, sorry, 28 to 30 strokes a minute. And actually now reducing it to 20 feels a little bit weird. And that's fine. The point of these low stroke rates is to keep that intensity down for a start, to let your training be accurately based on a heart rate, but it also gives you a chance to work on technique. There's an element of getting the feel for the stroke, because if you're charging up and down the machine at 28 to 30 strokes a minute. It's quite easy to just kind of miss the proper um, forces and weight sensation of the stroke itself. So by rowing at a low stroke rate, especially on a water rower or a Concept 2, what happens is that the machine slows down a lot in between each stroke. Meaning, as you come in for the next one, it's a heavier sensation to get the flywheel moving or the blades in the water. And that can just, I mean, can help from a strength element for a start, but it really does help with sensations of the stroke itself. And after all, I'm not talking about this 
from a rowing boar point of view, well, maybe I am. <laughs> I'm kind of trying to talk about its importance from a training fitness effect, because you might have read, seen, saw, watched, heard, anything else? Felt? No. <laughs> Smelled? No. Uh, that rowing is a all over body experience. Get the ultimate workout on a rowing machine because you use 80% of your muscles when you do it, which is true. As long as you're doing it right. <laughs> okay? And that's the thing. And I mean, listen, there's different, like, vastly different definitions of right. I'm not trying to preach the perfect rowing stroke to get you ready to do the Oxford Cambridge boat race or the head of the Charles or even so you can go and race and win the World Indoor Rowing Championships. All I'm trying to do is make sure you're using the right muscles to give yourself the best workout you can make sure you don't get injured when you're doing it but also make sure you're working your body efficiently because some people at this rate and pace can't even get their heart rate up because they're just not putting the force into the machine right where are we go do maths do we have 45 seconds left of this one? I think we do. So, that's why I tend to talk technique in quite a lot of my rows. And I've tried not to talk too much, as in like, do in an entire video row along workout, where all I do is talk technique. I've tried to kind of deal it out in bits through this Get Fit series, which is probably not a good thing. Maybe you needed it in a one All right, let's take two more strokes. Okay. Make sure to just rock on your sit bones from side to side. Have a drink. That rocking will reduce the pressure of your sit bones squashing your glutes. Just reseat your seat. That's how I describe it. Okay. So, three, two, one. Let's get into the next interval. I really, I mean, I'm not going to go in depth to the whole stroke. I've covered it quite a lot through this series so far. And even in the warm-up, I gave you the basic tenets of, a, of the rowing stroke, which are to have a forwards tilt into the front, straight arms, good posture, push with the legs. Hold that forwards tilt and straight arms as you're pushing with the legs. And then only when your legs are kind of past that halfway push point, do you finally swing over your back and pull in your arms, okay? Like if you, I'm not saying I've got the perfect technique, but if you watch the water on this rowing machine, you'll see that it's foaming white throughout a large part of the stroke. And that's me accelerating power into it. Okay, so if you only get a quick burst right at the front, chances are you're not adding in that backswing as well. Anyway, that's just a by the by. So that's the, the power side. 
is to push with the legs with straight arms, forwards tilt, which lets the power come up from your legs without your arms fighting against it. Then you add in that back swing and the arm pull. And then for the recovery, the return to the front of the machine, you're really just doing the opposite. So where you go legs, back, arms on the drive, and you go from one o'clock to 11 o'clock lean to your back angle. For the recovery, you go from, oh sorry, you go arms, back, legs. So the drive is legs, back, arms. The recovery is arms, back, legs. And your back is swinging just from that 11 to one again. And try to get to that one o'clock position before bending your knees. Hands should be past your knees before you bend them. That helps get you in the right position for the next stroke. It also helps posture, because usually if your knees come up too early, what that does is it rounds off your lower back, which collapses your posture and gets in the way of the power transfer. Right. And that is the main thing about technique. So legs, back, arms, arms, back, legs. Then it's all down to the finer points, which I have kind of been picking on one point every now and then in this series. And there's one I want to talk about today that's a short subject to talk about, but important and misunderstood. So once we've had our next rest, I'll jump into that. Hopefully your heart rate is well within the right zone. I am at 126 beats per minute which puts me at 66% of maximum. And what will be interesting is to see how much it falls in the next 30 seconds rest. Because that's kind of the point of these 30 seconds. You shouldn't need this rest. <laughs> okay, so entering that 30 seconds. Make sure to reseat your seat, have a drink. Breathe, relax. Okay, so I'm just keeping heart, keeping an eye on my heart rate. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Into interval three. So my heart rate recovered to 106. So that's 20 beats down over 30 seconds. Now you might think that's not much, but part of the thing here is that I'm not working that hard in the first place. Okay, it's not like I'm really stressing my system and then pausing to let my body recover from a really hard effort. I'm only at zone two, firmly in my green band on the Smart Row app right in the middle of it. So I know I'm not working hard, I'm right where I wanna be for a low intensity workout. And that's the real trick here, is trying to keep that intensity down if you're training based around your heart rate. I kind of touched on the difference between 2K training 
and heart rate in the intro. So apologies to the 2K plus 18 to 20 people that this doesn't really apply to you because you're just concentrating on pace no matter what your heart rate does. But if your heart rate based training, then you need to keep this at zone two, okay? If anything, I'd rather you were on the easier side. So when we're talking 60 to 70%, I'd rather you were further towards 60 than you were 70. Because you'll still get the mitochondria blood benefits even if you were in kind of zone one. Whereas if you broke out into zone three, those benefits start to reduce the more intense you get. But zone two is ideal because there still is an element of effort you have to put into the stroke in order to row. So therefore, there is a kind of minor strength gain to this as well. Like your legs will be working, your arms and shoulders will still be getting a nice workout. Your core, if you have a good posture at the back of the stroke, then your core is gonna get a nice workout too, rather than just taking it really easy down in zone one. Basically, zone three, not ideal. Zone one, less not ideal, <laughs> but more preferable to zone three. Zone two, well that's baby bear for a workout like this. This is exactly what you want because it'll build your base fitness and allow you the energy for the next workout in this series, which is back up to a maximum intensity one. Because even training benefits aside, if all you ever do is zone, say zone three, four, rowing where you're pushing yourself eventually you're just going to run out of steam you're going to feel burnout unable to continue whereas I could row a low intensity workout every single day and not need the rest day really rest days are just because we're throwing in some like two intense workouts a week and also just to give you a break from the rowing machine for a day or two or to let you do something else <sighs> okay a few more strokes and we'll get our next little rest stop so i'm still at 126 as i finish that so i did not have any cardiac drift through that interval. I just stayed exactly where I was the one before. Ah. 15 seconds to go. Reseat that seat. Okay, six, five, four, three, two, one, go. Um, like I've already said, those rests, you don't actually need them. You'll find most of the low intensity, 20 strokes a minute rows that I tend to do are kind of like half hour solid at 20 strokes a minute and low intensity. But these little breaks, like I say, gives your heart a chance to just come down a bit but also lets you um, 
Uh, I'm sorry, my watch keeps beeping at me because it's like, you're rowing, because I'm not using a watch-based app for this. Uh, what was the thing? Yeah, it also gives you a chance to have a little wiggle of your backside to reduce any potential discomfort from rowing for this long. But also to have a quick drink just to rehydrate slightly because often your heart rate is drifting up because of hydration or dehydration rather than exertion. So if you can make sure to keep fluids up, then you'll have a much more natural response from your heart. Now, I have, what do I have in my bottle? I'm trying to remember. I have some electrolytes, which you need to be sure you're okay just from a salt intake, if you have high blood pressure. Might be a bad idea to add salt, but check with your doctor. I also have uh, BCAAs, the branch chain amino acids, the essential acids that basically your body does tend to burn through when you're exercising, so it's a good idea to just give it a little top up. Is that it? Oh, and creatine. I've got some of that in as well, which just helps fuel your muscles. It's not just about bulking your muscles. <laughs> as you can see, I don't particularly have bulked muscles at all. So yeah, sometimes water just isn't enough. Those electrolytes, especially for longer rows, they become more and more important as you sweat more and lose salts from your body. It's kind of where cramp comes in. When you suffer too much electrolyte loss. So for a roll like this, possibly don't need to have electrolytes, but there's also an element of training your body to get used to uh, supplements and things mid-workout. Because what you don't want to do is be in the middle of a tough workout, have these for the first time, and then end up with a upset tummy. Certainly for things like high rocks that I race, everybody always says, Make sure and train with whatever fluids or bars you intend to use on race day. Just to make sure it's not a surprise to your guts <laughs> on race day. Ooh. Still, well, you know what? That's two intervals that have passed by where I haven't talked about technique, even though I said I was going to talk about one element of technique, I'll talk about the next one. But just as a spoiler alert, it's about your feet, or at least your heels on the foot plates, and how it's a concept that's misunderstood by many. Right, one more. Right, have a quick drink. Wiggle your backside. I've got two more intervals to go. You have to admit this workout's flying past as well. That's the other benefit of breaking a workout like this down into Smaller chunks with tiny rests in between. So I finished at 127 that time. Okay, two, one, go. Uh, sorry, I was too busy looking at my heart rate. I forgot to count you down. Hopefully you were looking at your clock as well. 
but don't worry if you miss the first stroke of this interval because you're like oh god we're going we're going one stroke isn't going to break the bank so i recovered down to 108 that time which will do it shows that i'm keeping this in a nice consistent zone i'm not finishing high or higher than i should and i'm not no and i'm still there we go get this the right way around i'm still able to recover as much as i was in 30 seconds earlier on in this workout so it shows that my body's quite happy with this format of five minutes on 30 seconds off and that's where the benefits come in for your body when it's like yeah here we go and this makes you fitter so heels uh, there was once upon a time <laughs> a video was made by someone not me with the best of intentions for new rowers that said do not lift your heels off the foot plates simple but unfortunately this got misinterpreted and suddenly everybody on the internet when it came to rowing advice was saying never lift your heels off the foot plate a few months maybe a year later I don't know what the time span was the original video maker made another video saying no 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 I just meant for new rowers to help with the sequencing and the power don't lift your heels because it can cause problems but by then the message had escaped and the horse had bolted and no matter how much they wanted to close the barn door the horse was still gone so what's the truth truth is if you can get in to the right position so that's forwards tilt of your back hinging over your hips not rounding your lower or upper back and you can slide forwards so that your shins are pointing vertically and are not splayed outwards do you get what I mean by that? so I want them your knees to kind of be inside your armpits or directly in line with your armpits if you find your knees are coming kind of out of your armpits or your elbows like this I don't know if you can see from that angle but you're having to open your knees out oh that hurts your groin that <laughs> hurts my groin then that's a sign of poor flexibility but if you can tilt forwards with a good posture come in to shins vertical and you can keep your heels on the foot plates well that's ideal because that way you don't have to worry about a timing connection between or for your feet pushing into the machine because you want to push off your entire foot that's the point here push like a deadlift you don't deadlift off your toes do you? and that initial moment of the drive is like that pushing in for a deadlift we shall continue this after our next short break in three two last one one okay wiggle your backside have a quick drink Ooh, I think something's wrong with my shoe because it's biting into my heel 
Oh, I've got about 20 seconds left to have a quick drink. Oh. Okay, 10 seconds. I've been lazy today. I haven't tied my laces. I think that's causing issues. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Our oh, last interval. Now my heart rate had skied up a little bit there to 130. Only came down to 113. So there was something amiss with that last interval. I was obviously working, well, I was either working too hard or talking too much and not breathing properly in between my sentences. But yeah, so you wanna come forwards and as you put the power into the machine, you want your heels on the foot plate. So you can see where they were coming from when they said, don't lift your heels. Because if you don't lift your heels, you don't have to worry about getting them back down in the foot plate. However, if you need to raise your heels by like an inch or so, as you come forwards, then as long as at the point when you push into the machine, you get those heels back down, it's perfectly fine. As long as you don't move your backside before your heels come down, it's perfectly fine. As long as you don't connect your hands to the machine before your heels come down, it's fine. And as long as you don't start swinging your back before your heels come down, it's fine. But you'll see, there's a lot of caveats in there. And so, that's a lot for a new rower to think about. Therefore, if you take the element of timing out of it by just saying, don't lift your heels, then all they have to concentrate on is making sure to push at the same time they feel the handle bite into the machine, whether that's a Concept 2, a water rower, a fluid row, an Aveyron, a magnetic rower, a hydraulic piston rower, who knows what you're using. As long as you push your feet at the same time, your hand, or hand, sorry, connect to the machine, you have that forward tilt and you're pushing with your heels down. That's all that matters. The danger for heels up is when you don't get the heels down, get the power in. But the real problem here is when your heels come up so far that your backside escapes from you. A bum rush, I think it's called, a butt scoot. So you come forwards and then the backside goes away from you. Up, because your heels come up, up, okay? So you lose so much power into the stroke from doing that. But also it shifts where what power you have goes through your body. Suddenly it's going more through your lower back than through your core and posterior chain. And therefore, there's a chance you could injure yourself, strain your back. It's the same with handle height. If you have a really low handle height, as you come forwards, it's easier to do in a concept too, to do it wrong, because I can only go so low in a water roar. But if you're really low, 
what happens is as you raise the handle, your back goes backwards. Right? Whereas if you keep the handle in a straight line, it maintains that back angle. One more stroke. Woo. All done. There we go. Sorry, that was a quick tag on at the end of a handle height. But it is important, if you come down, then jerk up, you're not going to get the power in, you're going to lose power. And therefore you're not going to give yourself the workout that you need in order to get your heart rate up, in order to be able to get the benefits from a workout like this. And it must be said also that, that this is where things like people who are unable to row at higher stroke rates, that's where it comes in. If you're over compressing into the front and your heels come up, or if your handle's so low you have to do an up, that breaks the rhythm and therefore it's harder to get your, um, your stroke rate up. So I'm just quickly programming in two minute cooldown. One thing I do wish about the Smart Row app, which I've not done a proper review of the Smart Row app yet. Um, I've, kind of, I've, had, have I had this machine a month yet? I think so. And I've not made a full review of the app because I want to uh, get used to how it works and, and kind of really have a proper um, think about it, but not just kind of go, oh, this is the first impressions. Um, I just wish it would save, have like a history of save things. And I don't know if, if, I'm just, if I'm just too stupid and I haven't found that I can have like a bank of a four minute warm up, a two minute cool down, et cetera. So anyway, here we go then. So a two minute cool down, sorry about that big long gap in between. In three, two, one, go. So just do this at exactly the same pace you've just been rowing at. And then a minute into it, you can just start to ease off the power. Keep the stroke rate the same, but just push less hard with your legs. There's a kind of a strange kind of intensity curve, let's call it. Not the one you see on screen, but like, if you're 20 strokes a minute, you can push quite lightly with the legs, go quite slowly. There you go, 20 strokes a minute. And I'm still rowing pretty much a one second drive, two seconds recover. Or I can really push and the weight of the machine, I'm kind of, it's making me hang and I'm taking longer over, or sorry, I'm putting more power into the stroke, even though it's taking the same overall pace through that drive. So you can just press lighter with your legs and you'll find it just eases off the intensity, but you're still rowing at 20 strokes a minute. So I think I kind of garbled my way through that. You probably are slightly slower from a drive speed when you press lighter with the legs. But when you push harder, it kind of, the front end of the stroke, because you're pushing with power, you're fighting against all the weight of the water or the air. And so, even though you might finish the back end of your drive faster, the front end of the drive is slower. Whereas with a weaker amount of force from your legs, even though the total drive length or drive time is the same, it's very even across it. So if, you've got, if you do have a force curve in your thing, you'll see it, where when you push really hard, you'll see the force curve goes way as you're kind of putting the power in. Whereas when you're pushing light, it just goes <laughs> And so that's the, that's the difference there. Oh, I should have thought about that before I talked about it because I think I've, <laughs> I hope I'm not confused you there. So we're now gonna enter into a stretching phase. If you don't have time to stretch, please um, take time to stretch your quads, your hamstrings and your glutes. If you have space, Stretching John will take you through how to stretch on a stretching mat somewhere, and then I will take you through how to stretch if you only have access to your machine. So put your feet back into the straps, get yourself comfortable in your seat, maybe sit midway on the seat, legs straight, hands in the air, fold forwards. And that fold, you should instantly feel that stretch right up here in your hamstrings, okay? If you've kind of just curled from your upper back or lower back, you're likely not feeling it in here, okay? So have another go, just hinge, fold forwards. Again, because you're, when you're on a rowing machine, your backside is a little bit higher than your feet. Even if you're not in a Concept 2, this, you still do have a, 
an angle difference between your backside, backside and your feet. So as you fold forwards, there is like a gravity thing that's kind of aiding with that stretch. So actually stretching, stretching on the rowing machine is, I find is fantastic for my hamstrings. Then if you are going to hold on to your ankles, please do, but don't pull yourself forwards. You can walk yourself forwards for a little bit of an extra stretch towards the end of each of like stretching your hamstrings, but don't pull yourself forwards because I don't want you to injure yourself. <sighs> right, I'm going to move on to glutes next. So put one leg up on the rail if you can. Yep. Other one, oh, I've done the wrong side again. Oh, John, I thought I was being smart there. Um, other foot comes over into the crook of your knee. Bring that knee across your body. So you have a straight line between your face, your knee, and your foot. And then hold it in place and rotate round. So now I'm at a little bit of a squinty angle here. I'm kind of diagonal, diagonalize. I'm on a diagonal across the machine because this, the dual rail on the, uh, on the water rower isn't quite as easy to do this on as it is on the Concept 2, but hopefully, You've worked out a way to do it. I wonder if there's a way. I'm thinking of wedging a piece of wood in between the two foot plates on this water rower anyway, because I find my, the my heels at the bottom come in together. Um, change legs. And I'm wondering if I put a piece of wood in between them, I could also rest my ankle on that when it comes to the stretching se section. But I'm gonna put a little bit of thought into it first, because I don't, don't really want to start drilling holes in my water rower. <laughs> if I don't have to, but I can't really think of another way to do it. But then it could be that I'm going to, I'm fixing a symptom when I should really be fixing the cause. Maybe it's a flexibility issue as I come forwards. Maybe I don't quite have the flexibility in there. And so that's why my heels are coming inwards. Maybe I should, should actually look at my stroke rather than wedging a piece of wood. It's like seat pads. Um, it says he usually stands up and there's clearly a seat pad on my seat, but that's to, to solve the problem with a, water rower seat that because it has a dip in the middle of it um, it's deeply uncomfortable for me and because it has a, a rise at the front of it so I've just moved sorry 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 I've just moved on to quads so stand on whoop, one leg flick your other leg up behind you so that your heel is then touching your backside obviously hold it in place with uh, your free arm um, yeah the water rower seat if you haven't heard me whining about it before when it comes to stock the right way around it has a little lip at the front of it that um, really hurts, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. So uh, Austin from Training Tall, one of my competitors, or well, not really, because he's massive and I'm not. Um, he has a video about how actually turning the seat round uh, solves that. And it kind of does, but it still does have that dip in the middle, so it still promotes that slouched um, posture as a result. Let's change legs. So what I discovered oh, is that if I put down uh, two of my row along wristbands, um, which if you're looking at it, if you can see little white bits underneath the pad, that's what they are, they're my little wristbands. I put them in the middle of the seat to kind of fill in the gap, and then I've got um, a standard foam Concept 2 seat pad um, that I then put on top of those wristbands, um, and that pretty much solves the problem with the seat on the water roar. Oh, the downside is, is that, um, hang on, I'll wait until I've finished stretching the squad, is that a standard Concept 2 seat pad has the two holes in the middle hi, um, for uh, your sit bones to go into to kind of make it a little bit more comfortable. However, I find that makes it really uncomfortable. <laughs> but hey, as big as can be choosers, it's better than the standard water row thing. Let's move on to uh, hip flexors. So one knee on the ground with your foot behind you, your other foot in front of you with your knee above it, 90 degree angles on both legs. And then nice straight posture. Tense that glute, and I recently heard someone else say, also tense your abs, as though you're about to get punched in the stomach, so urgh, that's a bit fun trying to talk at the same time. And then slightly lean back, and you should find your hip flex, oh mama, gets a good stretch in it. There we go, which it does for me. Um, yeah, anyway, so my point, why was I talking about seat pads? Because what you find is like on a Concept 2, which has a perfect seat, um, it's the right shape, it has the groove at the back for your tailbone and all that kind of stuff. Um, just discomfort for a lot of people when rowing on it because it's also a hard seat pad. Um, so people are rowing 15 minutes to get a sore backside and they instantly reach for a seat pad to kind of soften it. And there's two things to say about that. Um, let's change legs first. The first one is that, uh, there we go, so same thing again. Whoops, tense that glute, tense your stomach muscles and then lean back slightly. Oh, I'm gonna hold this one slightly longer. I'll tell both of my things because this is the leg I need to stretch better. Um, 
Yeah, so the two issues of the seat pad on a Concept2 or most rowing machines are one, that actually what you usually find is that it's just a new sensation, okay? So sitting down on a rowing machine, going through the process, um, pushing with your legs so your, your glutes are activated while your sit bones are kind of squishing into them. There's just basically, an, there's an element of wearing in your backside you have to do. But what also happens is that a lot of people, because of the slumped posture, their kind of tailbone's tucked underneath them. And then what happens is, as they come into the front, instead of tilting forwards and backwards over their hips, what they're doing is they kind of, they grind everything forwards. Um, so their sit bones are kind of grinding right across the glutes, like through quite a large area. And then they come back and they do exactly the opposite. So you're, it's like a rolling pin going over the muscles in your backside, um, if you have a poor posture. But these people end up with a sore backside, so they buy a seat pad to try and fix it. Um, which, in the cases of this Concept 2 one, it actually goes a good amount to fixing it because it's got those holes in the middle, and so therefore your sit bones are no longer squishing it against the seat. But that's one of those times where it's ugh, solving the symptom of a poor uh, technique that by grinding, by having that, that reduced, that kind of crunched posture, that's what you need to fix is the poor posture, not um, the, the symptom, the kind of what happens because of that, okay? So rant. Let's do our forearms and wrists. So hands together, push them together in front of your face and then bring them down in front of your body. Okay, so I'll bring my... This is... I, the, I never really realized um, quite how low the water roar was, especially compared to Concept 2. Um, I, I know, I know, I'm always... I'm like a, someone with a new girlfriend constantly comparing it to his old girlfriend kind of saying... It, so that's awful, comparing her. <laughs> uh, saying, oh, but she used to do it this way. Why can't you do it this way? I've never been like that. I mean, I've not, I've, listen, I've been uh, with Julie since I was 21. So that's what, uh, 27 years. Um, <laughs> that'll be 27 years this year that we've been together for. So I can't even remember having, a, having another girlfriend in my life. Um, 27 years, crikey. And it'll also be, we got married in 2004. So that's 19 years we've been married for this year. And I've, and I'm deeply happy. There we go. So let's do our shoulders next. So hands straight out in front of you. Bring it across your body. Rump. And hold it against your, that rump for podcast people is me using my other arm to kind of just lock it and pull it slightly against my body to give more of a stretch. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just, she's, I, I, I said before, she's my best friend. She's my best friend who I also smooch. <laughs> if you can find that. It's just a companion. You know, if you've been with someone for 27 years, you know that it's your companion. You've found someone who you're quite happy to go through. All the ups and downs. I've had so many different lives since we've been together. I think, um, I see when we got together, I was a squash player. So that's kind of what defined me at the time was a squash player. Then when I blew out my shoulder, um, I couldn't play squash anymore. So really what I was, was uh, someone who was gradually getting heavier and heavier. Um, I mean, I, I did balloon, I've said before, I ballooned from like 11 and a half stone to I was nudging 17 stone after about two years because um, I was just eating and drinking everything when I stopped as though I was still a squash player. Uh, so then eventually I thought, hmm, this isn't good. And so I then uh, got into cycling. So then I became a cyclist for a while, uh, for a good few years. I saw what I did and that can really help with the weight loss. Right about that time, oh, I forgot about the DJ. I was a DJ as well, mostly through my eating and drinking phase uh, was when I was kind of, I was working as a DJ in clubs and things. So, um, and that was quite dangerous because I'd sit there and just eat and drink while I was DJing. Not booze, but like Red Bull and things. Uh, biceps next, so hands behind you. So your ski jumper, rotate your thumbs outwards. So yeah, so I went from squash player to DJ to cyclist. Um, and then while, um, ooh, just got a text message. Or as from, I'm helping a student out with um, his editing career. I was just saying thank you for the latest help. Um, yeah, while I was in the cycling stuff, I started to get really into online poker, bizarrely. But all my friends played online poker, I played poker as well. So I used to go into theirs and we played poker together. It was, that was great. That was like, I felt very much like the Rat Pack, a group of like media guys all together sitting there playing poker until six o'clock in the morning. Um, that was fun. I enjoyed that life. Enjoyed all those friends as well and missed them, to be honest. Right, triceps next. So put one hand up in the air, let it come down, touch your spine, then use your other hand to help your elbow up into a bit more of a pointing straight to the sky point of view. Uh, and then from cycling, that went to rowing. 
Um, and then, because kind of where I'm, if you still think I'm still in that rowing world, I kind of sh seem to have shifted slightly into high rocks for the time being. But a lot of that is just because now that I'm 48, I'm at the wrong end of all of the age brackets for rowing. So everyone's beaten me. <laughs> so the high rocks thing is keeping me ticking over until I turn 50. And then I'll get back into proper competing again. At least that's the plan. But yeah, but Julie's been with me and supported me through all of these different lives. And she's really been a swimmer. And then a swimmer. <laughs> and she's not been, she's not had this kind of difference, um, different lives. Or maybe she has and I just haven't noticed. Wouldn't that be awful? <gasps> oh, I should really sit down with her and just say, how do you think you've evolved over our time together? And if she says, oh, I've been this, 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 and this, and I've been completely oblivious and blind to it all. I've been like, really? <laughs> when did that happen? Um, but I suppose not. She's been a swimmer, a runner, uh, I'm thinking just from a sport point of view. She's always been very consistent work-wise being a... Well, she was a systems developer for years and now she's a portfolio manager. So that's a big shift for her. Sorry, I should be talking about the stretches, shouldn't I? We did change, for those podcast people, we did change uh, tricep arms halfway through that rant about, about Julie. But yeah, but basically what I'm saying is that that's the point. When I do, this is becoming relationship advice with Row Along because I've already done one about... Um, don't cheat on your, don't, if you're gonna have a mistress, make sure it's a rowing machine, not like a real mistress. Um, but yeah, I think if you can find someone that is your companion, that, you're will, that you want to grow with, that you want to evolve, you want to change, and that you'll support them changing as you change and, and all that stuff. And sure, you might always load the dishwasher the way you wanna load the dishwasher and you'll never change, but that's the small stuff. <laughs> it's the big stuff that you really need to kind of support each other with. Um, and yeah, and it's not, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's the point. There we go. I'm going to stop talking about that stuff. So there we go. So that was today's low intensity row. Uh, this was So uh, row 13, if you're doing these four sessions a week, is the beginning of week four. So we're halfway through uh, this Get Fit By rowing plan. So I do hope you're enjoying it. The next one's going to be back up to that max intensity, okay? So this is how we're doing each of them, where we go low intensity, max, low intensity, and then that hard tempo one. So... Do make sure and keep an eye out for the next session, that max one. In the meantime, if you want to let me know how you're getting on with this one, please leave me the hashtag GetFitWithRowAlong just so I can see it no matter where you're posting it. And I will uh, go, oh, that's very nice. I don't, you can tag Rowalong Workouts into it as well. But yeah. Um, and then uh, for those who have saw it, this is right at the very end, so you're all going to miss this. But uh, I started doing a thing on the Facebook group called... Um, Accountability Monday. So basically on the Facebook group, I'm going to post at the beginning of the week, Accountability Mondays, and I'm going to put down what my goals for that week are. Okay, so this week it's being like kind of waking up early and doing some exercise and then making sure to film all these roll-alongs and doing weights at night. That's basically my goals, plus drink lots of water and stuff. Um, but I'm also inviting all the other users to do exactly the same. And then as you go through the week, you reply to your own comment, your own one, and you let people know how you're getting on. And we can all kind of support each other through this thing. Facebook isn't the ideal way to do this, but I've been thinking about this for quite a long time and I can't think of any other way to do it for the time being. So I'm doing it on Facebook until I work out whether people want to do this and then we can work about uh, migrating it somewhere else. But yeah, there we go. So we're doing that. I should have talked about that during our workout, but I didn't. I'll bring it up again throughout the week just in case. So thank you so much for doing this one. I will look forward to seeing you in one of my other videos, whether it's the next max intensity workout or one of the other ones. Until then, row well and be well. Bye-bye.